Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my Women in Translation video for 2022. Women in Translation Month was started by blogger Maytel Verdzinski, who noted that a minority of uh, women uh, were getting translated into English uh, from other languages. And so she wanted to create something to uh, bring more attention to uh, women who have been translated in hopes that, you know, more would be in the future. And it's become a bit of a popular thing on the online literary world. Over on BookTube, we have uh, some BookTubers who do an annual Women in Translation uh, Month readathon this month. Uh, there are, of course, several, you know, literary lists out there of possibilities you might want to read in Women in Translation Month. So I'll link to uh, the Women in Translation Month website down below. So for me, what I decided to do this year and most years is uh, take a couple books that were already on my TBR that happened to be works in translation and read them this month and talk about them here. Sometimes in past years I've scripted reviews or I might even be able to call this video a review, but in this case I'm really just going to wing it and talk about uh, what it was like, my thoughts on uh, reading the two books I read this month for this uh, challenge. Uh, I've talked in other videos, my cat's been uh, relatively sick. In fact, she has an appointment with a specialist on Monday, so a lot of my emotional energy is elsewhere right now. And, uh, and besides, I suppose I could look back and worry about, oh god, I made a Women in Translation video that was just rambling, but that's most of what I do on this channel anyway. <laughs> So I've read these two books. These are the final two books that were translated into English from the Hebrew, written by Ronit Matalan. And I thought I'd start by doing a quick little bio of uh, the author, uh, courtesy of Wikipedia. Uh, she was born in Ganei Tikva in Israel. Uh, she was the daughter of Egyptian Jewish immigrants. She studied literature and philosophy. She worked as a journalist. Near the end of her life, she was a resident at Haifa and taught literature at the University of Haifa. She also taught at the Camera Obscura School for the Arts in Tel Aviv. She was a social activist and member of a few uh, arts councils. She won a couple of awards, including the Bernstein Prize for the Hebrew original of this book, and the Brenner Prize for the Hebrew original of this book. And sadly, she died just at 58 years old after a battle with cancer a few years ago. So may her memory be a blessing. So one thing I think is interesting about these two books is the differences between them. This is a sprawling family epic, and this is really uh, arguably a novella uh, that only takes uh, part during uh, one day uh, in the life of a family. This is the book I read first, and The Bride Closed the Door, uh, which she published shortly before her death. Uh, and yes, it is about a, a bride closing the door on the day of her wedding and refusing to get married uh, for very vaguely defined reasons. And basically her family and her in-laws scrabbling to get her to go with the program here and to f understand what's going on. So it's a bit of a satire, uh, you know, it relies on a lot of uh, obscurity. Like at one point the uh, woman uh, explains, quote unquote, herself by uh, pushing a uh, vague poem that's sort of vaguely inspired by another poem out the door. Uh, and it takes twists and turns. The family, you know, they get more and more desperate as the day goes on and you have to worry about, you know, having to cancel everything and uh, how much that'll cost and just what's going on. So uh, they get to the point where they uh, hire a uh, bride therapist, a, a woman who is known for basically talking recalcitrant brides off the ledge and back into the marriage ceremony. And so she, in and of herself, is a, a bit of satire. Like at one point, uh, she gets a message from uh, some from some other client, and like has to says, "I have to leave immediately." A bride got out of the car at the way of her wedding to her wedding. So there's just a fair bit of absurdity uh, in play here, and it gets even more absurd when uh, they uh, reach out to a, a friend who has access to a Palestinian Authority truck that has, you know, a, a ladder that they can uh, send up to the window so that the, the bride therapist can talk to the bride since no one can get through the locked door. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, and then once, you know, it's out on the streets, there's a lot of, you know, reactions uh, from the neighbors who don't actually understand anything of what's going on other than seeing, you know, a truck out in the middle of the street and, uh, you know, a woman going up to knock on a bedroom door. So, yeah, um, 
I thought it was enjoyable, uh, but I guess uh, I feel like uh, this sort of thing is so slight that uh, it doesn't usually catch my fancy. Uh, you know, there's just not a lot of room to play with characters and situations here, but I also feel like uh, I chuckle a bit at satire sometimes, but otherwise it doesn't always work for me, maybe I, in the taking myself too seriously camp. Then we have this book, The Sound of Our Steps, which Madelon wrote a little earlier, uh, and I would say it's much different. I mean, I think there are some like absurd little moments every now and then, but I, it doesn't really turn the axle, as it were, in quite the same way. And, you know, instead of being hyper-focused on a specific event, it's very unfocused. Uh, and we're following this uh, presumably autobiographical, to an extent, family of uh, Mizrahi uh, Jews. Mizrahi Jews are from uh, Middle Eastern descent, and at least a few of these family members come from Egypt. And through these very uh, disconnected vignettes, we're just following this family as they're living uh, in a slum outside of Tel Aviv in the middle of the century. Uh, and uh, so there's not a lot of major focus. And in fact, you know, my trouble with this is that everything was so disconnected from one another, there's no real, you know, overarching plot of things happening that it's easy to forget what happens in each vignette because they're all so insular and uh, just uh, connected, uh, I think, to the the broader theme, the theme is of what it's like to grow up in this sort of situation, uh, because uh, the main character, who is a nameless uh, child, or usually nameless ch child, is sort of our, our, our focal point, to a degree, so what it is to grow up in this situation. Uh, and a few, you know, of the vignettes would stick out to me, but a lot more of them wouldn't. So I would say that even more than the other book, this one really isn't my style because it's so disconnected and, and unconcerned with uh, traditional narrative. And I feel like as I've grown older, I've grown less and less enamored with this sort of writing and I want something a little uh, more direct, especially, you know, when other things are going on in my life. There is some beautiful writing in here and, you know, I appreciate the fact that this is taking a broad look at, you know, uh, the cultural issue of what it was like for Mizrahi Jews at the time. A lot of them, including this family, were, you know, economically less well off and just sort of subjugated uh, in a lot of uh, ways uh, by the dominant uh, Ashkenazi or European uh, descended society. Uh, and. Uh, the family even has to deal with like some like uh, microaggressions, I guess could be the word, from some employers. And a lot of the book has to do with the conditions of their, you know, tumbling apart shack that they live in. And the father in the book is involved in uh, politics, uh, sort of uh, anti-Ben-Gurionist politics. Uh, uh, and uh, so we do get a little more, in, a little bit into politics here and there. Uh, especially in these epistolary vignettes where the father's going off on a tear and occasionally maybe we'd mention something like the Six Day War in passing. But it's interesting, I guess, to compare to this book where I guess some of the references of things are in passing, like for example, the bride and groom were going to take uh, their wedding pictures with Sudanese uh, immigrants and you know, that uh, you know, sent people down a spiral of what the hell did she, uh, why would she want to do that, and that doesn't really get resolved. It feels like a bigger deal in this just because the book itself is it's smaller. <laughs> and also the fact that there's a Palestinian Authority truck being used to, for the therapist to reach the woman means that the uh, neighbors are uh, going to have a response to that that, you know, delves into political realities. So I feel like this is actually, uh, in the plot and also the politics are a lot more pointed, I feel like, in this one. But it's short enough that it's not too overbearing. <laughs> Whereas this one, uh, the politics, uh, you know, are so scattered within it that that's why it's not overbearing. And I guess I found both of these, but especially this book, interesting in that they are disconnected from, I think, what a lot of uh, Israeli novelists I read uh, talk about Israel in the sense of being very connected to the idea of Israel as a nation or as a religious center, whereas uh, in these two books, uh, especially this book, it's less so about that. And it's really seeing Israel and families from a different light. And I did find that very intriguing. But overall, I guess I kind of am disappointed. I feel like these particular styles weren't for me. Maybe I feel a little ashamed that I need something a little more traditional, but there is something tried and true including in literary fiction about, you know, a narrative with, you know, an arc that isn't so disconnected so that you can really get to, you know, understand and uh, grapple with uh, the people and situations uh, that I didn't quite 
get to uh, with these two. Uh, but that being said, I'm glad that I uh, gave this author a try, and both of these uh, books were also translated by female translators. This one was translated by Jessica Cohen, and this one was translated by Dahlia Bilu. And for a different take on both of these books, I will uh, go to the Jewish Book Council reviews uh, and uh, read a little bit there. Uh, this uh, one for uh, And the Bride Closed the Door is by Ron and Omer Sherman. She writes uh, this story, beautifully translated by Man Booker International Prize winner Jessica Cohen, is brimming with wise and compassionate commentary on a plethora of concerns, culturally imposed gender roles, the role of public and private memory, and the dysfunctions that drive families apart. Above all, it deals with the secret inner lives of her cast of characters. And for The Sound of Our Steps, also this review was written by Ron and Omer Sherman. A wonderful interrogation of the meaning of home, belonging, and the past's unyielding claim on us, The Sound of Our Steps is a truly epic achievement. A tapestry of richly associational vignettes, vividly explored from different perspectives, a journey of many unexpected twists and turns, encompassing the comedy as well as the tragedy of a genuinely unforgettable family. And she ends up with a note to the translation with translator Dahlia Bilu superbly captures Madelon's intensity, lyrical and demanding language, especially the family's exilic speech, a colorful collage of Arabic, French, and Hebrew. So yeah, it's uh, nice uh, to have uh, some uh, confirmation probably from someone a little more in the know that uh, this translation, you know, fits the bill. <laughs> And that about covers it for me now. Uh, I will uh, link to the two Jewish Book Council reviews I mentioned down below, as well as my own two Goodreads reviews for uh, these two books down below. They might be somewhat different, but hopefully they'll give you varying perspectives on uh, this particular author and uh, two of her books in translation. I will be back on this channel, hopefully within the next couple of days, to talk about more books that I am reading for my final Am Reading update of the month. In the meantime, as August uh, wraps up, I hope everyone participating in Women in Translation Month has found fiction that if they aren't fully enjoying, uh, at least, uh, you know, uh, tickles their interest in some way or another. I certainly enjoyed grappling with these two books about uh, what the author might be trying to achieve and uh, the differences and similarities and uh, what she was uh, talking about in these uh, books about uh, family and uh, realities in Israel. Uh, so I still think this was a win for me. I always do uh, appreciate reading no matter what. And I hope you feel the same with your reading, be it for Women in Translation Month or anything else. So yeah, <laughs> thanks so much for watching everyone. And I'll see you next time.